there. My name is Maureen McCarthy, and I'm the current president of City Club. We thank you for being here on Veterans Day, a holiday with special meaning for many of us. If you are a veteran in attendance, we're not able to offer you a round of applause here on Zoom, but know that we thank you and we are thankful for you. Our mission at City Club is to inform, connect, and engage our community to strengthen the civic health of our region. We emphasize civil conversations and listening to others. I'd like to thank all the volunteers who are working today to make today's meeting possible. I'd also like to thank the members of our board of directors and our program committee who contribute their time and talents throughout the year. I'd like to thank BTV Bellingham who will be making a recording of today's program available for their viewers and TVW Olympia who is live streaming right now. Finally, I'd like to thank our business sponsors. They are Larson Gross, Lummy Commercial Company, Danny Neal of the Mullion Group, the Opportunity Council, Pacific Continental Realty, Unity Care Northwest, Village Books, Western Washington University, Whatcom Community College, and the Whatcom Community Foundation. Although we won't meet again until January, I'd like to ask you a favor in advance. In order for us to get a more accurate count of how many people attend our programs, we ask that when you register, you indicate how many people will be attending with you. You can do this by registering yourself as well as a guest or multiple guests. Final note, we welcome your questions today and we will be gathering them through a slightly different method. Instead of typing them into the chat box, please type them into the Q&A box located directly beside it. Don't forget to hint enter or return. And now I would like to introduce Dean White, who will introduce our speaker and moderate today's program. Thanks, Maureen. Um, before I talk about today's program, let me just remind folks, once again, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have a question for our guest. Uh, our team of moderators uh, and monitors will be watching for questions and I'll pose as many as I can. The title of our program is Sports and Resistance, Activist American Athletes at the Intersection of Sports and Politics. Just as American politics and political coverage have changed enormously in this still young century, so too have American sports and the media coverage of those sports. Athletes now refuse to take the advice of some pundits and politicians that they just quote, shut up and dribble. Instead, they have become big players in the nation's political and cultural debates. Similarly, media coverage is no longer just about who won and lost, though that certainly still means a lot to Seahawks fans on game day. Sports clearly are at the intersection of politics and culture. There's no one better to talk about this new landscape than our speaker today. Dave Zirin is sports editor of The Nation magazine. It's first ever, I believe, and the producer of a blog, edgeofsports.com. He is the author of 10 books, including A People's History of Sports in the United States and Game Over, How Politics Has Turned the Sports World Upside Down. His most recent work, uh, which was co-written with former Seattle Seahawks defensive end Michael Bennett, is called Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. Veteran sports writer Robert Lipset has called Dave Zirin, quote, the best sports writer in the United States. And Dr. Cornell West has said of him, brother Dave Zirin is the finest, most influential writer, most important writer on sports and politics in America. So I'm pleased to welcome our speaker today, Dave Zirin. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Uh, doing these kinds of Zoom calls uh, and, and talks is certainly a bit of a different rhythm than doing it in front of an audience, but uh, I think we're all used to it by now. Um, I'll, I'll start by just saying a little something about myself and my own relationship with sports. Um, I grew up as a sports player and fan in the 1980s in New York City. I played every sport. I 
played basketball. I played baseball. I was the starting center for the New York City Friends Quakers. Uh, we called ourselves the Fighting Quakers, which isn't too intimidating, I don't think. Um, I also, you know, was an absolute fanatic about opening up the newspapers, reading the sports pages every day, memorizing every statistic. Uh, my room was like a shrine to the stars at the time, people like Lawrence Taylor and Keith Hernandez. Um, I didn't know at the time that all those folks had serious uh, drug problems, but uh, I didn't really care because I was a sports fan and never gave that too much of a second thought. Um, I never gave much thought to the politics of sports. That was never anything that meant anything to me until I was in college in the 1990s. And there was a basketball player named Mahmoud Abdul Raouf uh, for the Denver Nuggets who made the decision that he was not going to stand for the national anthem. Sounds familiar. And I'll never forget uh, watching the coverage of Mahmoud Abdul Raouf and announcers saying that he must see himself in the tradition of <clears throat> activist athletes, people like Muhammad Ali, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Billie Jean King. And at that moment, I realized that I thought I knew something about sports, but I didn't know this whole other history. I didn't know there was such a thing as activist athletes. I didn't know that athletes themselves had played a tremendous role in shaping the political language of this country. And I started studying it. And that study has led me here today to speak with you. Uh, and what I found out was that a lot of the things that I thought I knew about sports uh, were actually not the case. Like my, my father is from Brooklyn and I thought I grew up knowing the story of Jackie Robinson, for example that Jackie Robinson, through his single-handed effort, uh, smashed the color line in Major League Baseball and became the first black Major League Baseball player. One thing I didn't know was the story of Lester Rodney. Uh, Lester Rodney was a crusading sports writer in the 1930s for the Communist Party's newspaper, The Daily Worker. And he led an activist campaign throughout the 1930s to integrate Major League Baseball. And Lester lived to be well into his 90s, sharp as a tack. And I was able to interview Lester a great deal about his efforts in the 1930s. And that was an unforgettable experience. He passed away um, in 2010. Uh, and I'll never forget talking to Lester and Lester saying to me, why do you care about these stories about Jackie Robinson and sports and politics? And I said, because these stories aren't being told and I wanna take your stories and, and tell them to a broader audience. They're amazing stories. And Lester said to me, ah, to be 80 again. And I always appreciated that from Lester, that he was tremendously young at heart. Um, and he was so proud of the work that he did in this area of the world. You know, and speaking of Jackie Robinson, I thought that the way I was taught about Jackie Robinson was that he integrated Major League Baseball by being quiet and by just taking the abuse of white players and somehow pushing through. I didn't know about the Jackie Robinson who was a barnstorming speaker for civil rights in the 1950s. Somebody who commanded large audiences, somebody who uh, marched with Dr. King, somebody who uh, was an organizer of the Great Youth March in Washington, D.C. that took place um, at the end of the 1950s. Uh, and Jackie Robinson would always end his speeches the same way. He would say, if I had to choose between the Baseball Hall of Fame and full citizenship for my people, I would choose full citizenship time and again. Now, the other part about Jackie Robinson, which I learned through, through study, was that Jackie Robinson was also the most requested speaker during the civil rights movement of Southern branches of the NAACP. The second most requested speaker was someone you might've heard of named Martin Luther King. And I always thought, thought that that was kind of amusing, the idea that people would be trying to organize an event and would think that uh, Martin Luther King would be their second choice if they couldn't get Jackie Robinson. Fast forward to the 1960s, I thought I knew the story of Muhammad Ali uh, as the anti-war loquacious boxer uh, who had the world on, on the tip of his fingers. I didn't know that Muhammad Ali during his day was probably the most hated athlete um, in the history of the United States, precisely because of the unpopular stances he had about the black freedom struggle and about the war in Vietnam. 
and to learn about Muhammad Ali's transformation, the way he was both shaped by the 1960s, but then also shaped the 60s himself as probably the most famous draft resistor in the history of war. I mean, was something that I just did not know. And learning that history, it taught me about the power of the activist athlete. Similarly, Billie Jean King, I thought that was a tennis player. Um, I knew somewhere in my head that she was a feminist of some kind. I had no idea that she was a fighter, not only for women's rights, but that she was greatly influenced by Muhammad Ali. And I also didn't know that her activism was essential to the passage of Title IX legislation in 1972. Some of the most important legislation um, in the history of the United States, the most important civil rights legislation in terms of the effect that it's had on the lives of women in this country. And what I've learned through all this study is that sports and like politics is baked into the cake of sports and sports is baked into the cake of politics. You can't really have one without the other. As soon as there were organized sports in the United States at the, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, what you have is a contradiction at the heart of it. And that contradiction was that sports was meant to express American meritocracy. This idea that if you're good enough, you can make it on the field and you could find glory. Yet the flip side to that was that if you were uh, black or brown, if you were a woman, if you were someone who lived with a disability, uh, sports were not for you. So the entire history of sports is this so-called level playing field that's actually a very unlevel playing field where people are constantly fighting for access. And it's that very contradiction uh, that means that sports has always been political because it's always been about people fighting for access to the field and it's turned it into a political space. And that is why you can't tell the story of the civil rights movement without Jackie Robinson or the 1960s without talking about Muhammad Ali or 1968, the fires of 68 without speaking of Tommy Smith and John Carlos raising their fists in Mexico City at the Olympics or the women's movement in Billie Jean King or the LGBTQ movement and leaving out people like Martina Navratilova. And this applies to the present. Um, it's difficult to speak about the Black Lives Matter movement without thinking of the image of Colin Kaepernick, then of the San Francisco 49ers taking a knee during the national anthem. You can't speak about one without speaking about the other. Now, what I wanna talk about for my time here is about 2020. I wanna bring it all up to the present and what happened this past August, which was nothing less than a sports strike wave against racism in the United States that touched on every major sport. And to have a sense of what happened, we need to understand how it detonated. It starts by understanding the impact of the police murder of George Floyd, uh, which led to the most important social uprising in decades and the largest series of marches in the history of the United States. It's a social uprising that was met with terrible violence, uh, in, in the face of both the police, uh, violent white militia movements, um, and the violence that, that, that grew out of some of the demonstrations themselves. But there's no denying the fact that they, these demonstrations, they took place in all 50 states, they took place in towns large and small. I mean, this was history that happened in front of our eyes in the midst of a pandemic this past summer. And the demonstrations were so intense that in June, Players in the NBA and the WNBA, that's the National Basketball Association and the Women's National Basketball Association, they, they argued back in June about whether they should go back to play in what was a bubble in Orlando, a COVID-free bubble, or if they should just sit out the rest of the season so as not to distract from the demonstrations in the streets. This was a real debate among NBA players. I mean, the demonstrations were having such a profound effect on them, they didn't know whether they should go back and play or whether they should take a back seat. And this is what one player said to ESPN. He said, once we start playing basketball again, the news will turn from systemic racism to who did what in the game last night. It's a crucial time for us to be able to play and impact what's happening in our communities. We are asking ourselves where and how can we make the biggest impact? Do we make a bigger impact by playing or do we make a bigger impact by not playing? 
Now they did of course go back and play. And as part of the deal, uh, the franchise owners and the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, people might've seen this. If you're a basketball fan, they incorporated Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter messaging onto the court with Black Lives Matter written on the court, players kneeling during the anthem, slogans written on uniforms, and you could call this, if you want, woke marketing, uh, but it was corporate symbolism in the model of so many companies that put out statements against racism uh, during the demonstrations. Uh, so many companies did this. This wasn't unique to the NBA, but we saw this across the landscape of companies that wanted to take the energy and turn it into corporate synergy. But that all changed in August after the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The contradiction became too intense. Players in the NBA and WNBA, they felt like chumps. That's what one player said to me. He said, I feel like a chump uh, because they felt like they were in a figurative and literal bubble away from their families and friends, living in dorms and saying to one another, here we are playing with Black Lives Matter written on the uniforms, written on the courts and nothing really changes. So there's this tremendous frustration was building up that they weren't really doing anything to help anybody. They were just in this remote bubble leading this bizarre, privileged COVID life. And that led to the Milwaukee Bucks, and remember Milwaukee's just 45 minutes from Kenosha, Wisconsin, to decide not to play in their playoff game. They literally went on strike. They went on strike against playing in their playoff game. It's something that we had never seen before in sports. Just that one team doing that, we're already making history. But then other NBA teams followed suit. Soon none of them were playing. Then WNBA teams said that they would be sitting out. Then it went to Major League Baseball, which was absolutely stunning, given its conservative history and lack of Black American players. You had Major League Baseball teams refusing to play. Then Major League Soccer. And then amazingly, the National Hockey League followed suit. And then Naomi Osaka, the tennis star of Japanese Haitian descent also bowed out of a tournament that she was going to be in at that time. Now, the sports media largely called these boycotts, but that's a big mistake. Uh, they're not boycotts, they were strikes. These athletes are not consumers, they're workers. And they were withholding their labor in protest of police murder and white supremacy. Now. Some people have cynically rolled their eyes at this. After all, as they say, these are very wealthy people. People say athletes are not real workers. What could they really accomplish? And this analysis, I would argue, misses three very important objectives that the players accomplished. First, they recentered the conversation around Jacob Blake and around the issue of police brutality and not on how it was being reframed at the time, which was about anarchists burning down cities and not about what was causing all this anger in the first place. Second, they captured people's imagination about the idea that labor could strike for black lives, that the labor movement could be part in the fight for racial justice, something we have not seen in this country for decades. And lastly, I think they gave a sense of hope to people during a period of profound sadness and helplessness because after the Kenosha shootings, there was this feeling that people marched after George Floyd's murder, but here we are, nothing changes. And here the players were saying, well, here's another strategy that we can pursue. We can actually disrupt the economic workings of our system. That is all incredibly important, especially the second point. I have to say, and the second point was about introducing labor into the struggle uh, for black lives. I received about half a dozen calls from labor folks asking me how to contact the players uh, when all this was happening. And they felt a real challenge to no longer be on the sidelines. But the radical potential of this moment also meant that within hours of these strikes, the forces of co-optation were also working overtime. Now sports owners who tend to be more of the conservative sort were scrambling to show their support for the players. Uh, and they were doing so because to not broadcast the games because of strikes meant losing literally billions of dollars in television revenue. That's where the money really is in sports. It's in the TV deals, not so much fans in attendance. Entire teams started putting out statements and talking about action plans that came out of conversations between management and labor. 
So instead of players striking, it was teams announcing that they would not be playing. So it was the teams announcing it together saying, oh, this is not a strike. This is us together making a stand. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens of the NFL are a great example of this. They put out a, a statement on team letterhead uh, decrying racism and all with the aim of appeasing their own football players and making sure that there, that's the strike wave would not go to the National Football League. Now, the players in all these leagues, in an absence of a lead from the broader labor movement, they were sort of left operating in a vacuum, trying to wrest concessions from ownership to join the struggle for Black lives. And as one could imagine, this led to the tamping down of demands, which with much of the energy being channeled towards the November election, most notably an agreement to open up stadiums as voting centers, which was a beautiful and successful thing, but it doesn't exactly connect with why people were protesting in the first place. Now, this has led some people to think that this is a story that ends with co-optation, but I would argue that this is wrong. Again, this is a story that I would argue is being written in pencil, not pen. We still don't know where this is going. And we need to understand that this situation has been very transformative for the players involved. They now have incredible leverage going forward to use their spotlight to extract concessions from management or to go back out on strike again if they feel like the world does not exist in a way that they would like to see it. They are feeling their agency as a way to shape the world. Now, we don't know where this is heading, but instead of decrying this for what it isn't, we need instead to be holding up their example to the rest of the labor movement and the rest of society to act with similar urgency to this political moment. Now, I'm not saying we should expect athletes to do this for us, but, but what we can do is acknowledge that any action which lays down a gauntlet and challenges the labor movement to act should be seen as a step forward. Striking for black lives is now on the table, not as an abstraction, but as a goal worth fighting for. And the fact that we can have this, even have this conversation in 2020 shows the ways in which athletes are feeling their power in a ways that we simply have not seen in this country for about 50 years. So th those are my opening comments there. And I'm happy to take any questions that folks might have. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, uh, we've talked. You've talked about uh, activism of athletes here in the United States, uh, but you've also written recently about uh, Marcus Rashford, uh, who at age 23 is one of the greatest soccer players in the world, and he's using his platform to address the outbreak of youth hunger in the UK uh, as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, can you tell us more about what Marcus Rashford is doing? And also, is, is there a Marcus Rashford on the horizon in the United States? Well, to answer the second one first, we, we, uh, we don't have a Marcus Rashford as of yet, but I'm hoping that if we hold up his example, uh, that perhaps someone could be inspired to, to, to actually take up that role. Uh, Marcus Rashford, as you mentioned, 23-year-old soccer superstar, someone who he himself experienced hunger uh, when he was growing up, uh, grew up very poor. And he, alongside his mother, Melanie, decided to go on a campaign. He plays for Manchester United. They decided to go on a campaign to feed 400,000 hungry children in Manchester. And their efforts at philanthropy were so successful that 400,000 number became 4 million. And they were able to um, get, get food services out to people across uh, the country. Um, but at the same time, they realized that philanthropy would not be enough. So what they did was they made an effort to actually petition the government of Boris Johnson, conservative leader um, in the UK, um, to actually uh, increase food aid uh, for youth in the country. And they gained over a million signatures. It turned into a huge social movement. And not once, but twice, they were able to get Boris Johnson to turn away from his position that the government should not be helping hungry children to getting them to do just that. So, I mean, it's a heck of an accomplishment for a 23-year-old to be able to do something like that, to actually change government policy. And I think in the United States, where you've seen 8 million uh, families 
uh, slip into poverty since the start of the, the COVID pandemic, um, getting an athlete to take up this issue, I think could have a very powerful effect and connect with a lot of folks. I mean, the question of food insecurity is one that stalks way too many families in the United States. And it would be great to see an athlete to take that up. But the other reason I'd love to see it, I have to say, is that I don't want to see athletes now fade back now that the elections are over, but to continue to use their, um, their, their political weight to try to figure out ways to shape the world. Great. That's, uh, um, we've seen, uh, st stick with COVID for a minute, uh, we've seen a number of high-profile athletes um, like Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence most recently uh, test positive for COVID-19. Uh, this is having a um, pretty major impact on both college and professional sports. How well generally do you think professional and college sports have done uh, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? You talked about how the NBA went into this bubble, uh, but generally, how, how have they done with this? Well, Generally, you know, it, I'd like to start by uh, quoting a sports writer named Jane McManus, who said that um, sports are really the reward for having a functioning society. Mm -hmm. And right now, our society isn't really functioning because of COVID, um, because of division, but mainly because of COVID. And so in the absence of a functioning society, there's this effort to try to get the games to play no matter what because of fear of, of, of losing billions of dollars. So, you know, so, so the sports leagues have all been dealt a rough hand in terms of trying to do this in the absence of a functioning society. I think the professional sports that have been able to enact this kind of bubble, um, this hermetically sealed space have done the best job with this because if the goal is to do as little harm as possible and you know, the effects on an athletic body of COVID, I mean, we still aren't even sure what the long-term effects can be. That's been very positive. Sports that are less concealed, and it's much more difficult to do this in sports the National Football League, um, have seen outbreaks and are continuing to see outbreaks. There's news of it every day. And at college, there's something particularly noxious about the process, precisely because uh, these are athletes who don't get paid. Uh, these are athletes who find themselves in a very difficult situation where if they're not, they have no union. So they have no personal ability or collective ability to say that they disagree with what the coach is putting forward. And if they do, they run the risk of losing their scholarship. And, you know, when you factor in also uh, the degree to which it's so difficult on today's college campus, I mean, what are you going to do? Just have games and have the students stay at home? I mean, it's just not going to work that way. So I, th I think in college, it's the, the early returns are that it's been somewhat of a disaster. Um, but at the professional level, I mean, if you're able to uh, hermetically seal people off and broadcast games, well, then you can pull it off. Let's just uh, let stick with college sports for just a minute. Um, in many states, and I think in, until recently in this one, Washington, uh, the highest paid public employee is often mm -hmm. the football coach at a state university. Um, and football does bring in a lot of money, a lot of revenue for those universities and helps fund all kinds of programs. Yet the athletes who do the work, as you just said, uh, you know, they're not professionals. They aren't paid. Uh, and there has been some discussion that perhaps they should be paid. Uh, sure, they're getting a free education, they're on scholarships, but is that enough? Uh, what, what do you think about that? Should, uh, should, uh, should college athletes be compensated in, in other ways? Well, it's so interesting because uh, universities are so dependent on the economics of the revenue producing sports of basketball and football that at many schools, um, th they've been declared essential workers during the COVID crisis. So, you know, in a state like Michigan, where they're saying people need to, um, where they need to do remote learning, uh, the football games can go on as planned precisely because they're essential workers. Now, what makes them essential? What makes them essential is that they're um, absolutely intrinsic to the economic workings of the school itself, not just the salaries of the coaches, as you mentioned, but so many other, I mean, the tentacles of the economics of football go into so many different parts of a given community, particularly in a small college town. So it, it's, uh, 
it, it's, it's a very difficult um, situation that they find them in. But to me, by calling them essential workers, it kind of gives the game away, so to speak. And it's like, so of course they're campus employees. Of course they are. Of course they, they should be able to organize uh, unions to be able to negotiate their health and their safety and their wages. Um, and if that means a, a coach like Nick Saban at Alabama doesn't make $10 million a year, he makes $7 million a year. So players can get paid. I mean, I think having a more just system uh, is, is something worth fighting for. Uh, question from, um, from one of our members here. Um, I, I've been thinking about this too. Um, uh, Jamel Hill in the Atlantic uh, wrote about the impact of um, especially NBA and WNBA players had possibly on the election in Georgia, uh, where there was quite a lot of activism. And um, so one of our members is asking, do you believe that players' actions have really had an influence on the presidential election? And just to kind of follow up on that, uh, fans live everywhere, uh, both in urban areas and in rural areas. Uh, you know, and there's a distinct split in those urban and rural voting patterns. So how did the athletes movement about racism uh, show up in voting results or, or did it? Oh, I would argue it had a real impact. Now, if you want me to answer, did it have an impact uh, positively or negatively in one direction or the other? Uh, that's something I definitely want to read more upon uh, to see who was provoked and wasn't provoked to vote in, in this last race and what motivated them. But I think that when you have uh, a thirst for politics reflect itself in, um, in different aspects of our culture, whether that cult, whether that we're talking about the arts, whether you're talking about film and whether you're talking about sports, I think what it does is it creates a mood in the country that makes it more difficult for people to, sh to, to shut their eyes and to turn their way away from what's happening. And when you think about sports in particular and the influence that sports has among communities of color, uh, certainly in urban communities, then I, I do think that the role that the athletes played um, during this election season was, was, was very important and, and, and it left an imprint. And in some ways, you know, that's, that's ephemeral and cultural, like the idea that you should vote is in the air and so you should do it as well. In other ways, it was more concrete, like athletes like LeBron James uh, heading up an entire vote campaign, raising tens of millions of dollars. So the formerly incarcerated in Florida uh, would be able to pay off their court fines and be able to vote in this past election. I mean, or, and this is what Jamel Hill wrote about, uh, the ways in which uh, the players in the WNBA challenged an owner in the WNBA, Kelly Leffler, of the Atlanta dream uh, because she was somebody whose politics were so incredibly at odds with what a lot of the players were pushing for. So no, I, th I think the impact of NBA and WNBA players in particular on this election season was really strong. And then in some ways it was strong at the most grassroots possible way, because one of the things that it revealed was how few pro athletes were even registered to vote themselves. <laughs> And so teams went about trying to register every single member of the team to vote. And it found that, you know, you had teams where one person, two people were even registered and they were able to register the entire team. Uh, you've written about uh, uh, John Carlos. Uh, the, in fact, I think you were a co-writer with him yep. on, on one of your books. Uh, His memoir, yeah. Fact star who uh, stirred a lot of controversy in 1968 when uh, he, he and Tommy Smith gave the Black Power salute at the Olympic Games in Mexico City. Um, you've talked a little bit about this. I'd just like to hear more about how, how far have we come in our attitudes as a nation, as fans, as media, toward athletes who speak out politically? How, let's, let's make it specifically. Let's talk about how far has sports journalism come in covering that? Well, <clears throat> it's a great question. I mean, first, I think we have to identify that when people say they don't want sports and politics to mix, what they're really saying is they don't want sports and a certain kind of politics to mix. Uh, there are other kinds of politics that people are fine to, whether, to, to go with sports. Um, 
certainly in terms of, of nationalism and things of that nature are always a part of sporting events. And whether one agrees or disagrees with that, that is, uh, you know, unquestionably politics. Uh, it's when athletes try to speak out that you um, begin to run up against these problems uh, where people start uh, showing resistance and pushing back. Um, I think it's been glacial, but progress has been made since the days of Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Um, and I would put that progress really um, lay it at the feet of social media, hmm. because one of the things, because you mentioned sports journalists, sports journalists tend to be um, a conservative lot um, relative even to the sports fans audience. Um, but what social media has allowed for is for athletes to go around that filter and speak directly to their fans. And that's something even the great Ali with all of his uh, loquacious abilities, he could not do. He needed Howard Cosell as almost like his, uh, his translator from, <laughs> from himself to getting out there to the, the white majority in the United States, like he needed Cosell. Players don't need a co-sell these days. Um, they only need their own savvy, their and their own ability to uh, use the social media platforms that they have to present and project outward. And I think that's made a huge difference for the athlete themselves because it definitely pre prevents them from being misunderstood. And that's one thing about John Carlos is, you know, he he didn't trust the media, and when the media reported about him and Tommy Smith. I would go back and look at this with John. They generally reported lies about who they were, what they stood for, why they raised their fist on the medal stand. And, you know, that, that kind of thing, uh, we're able to do so much about that now uh, because of social media. Well, just sticking with this for a minute, um, um, there are so many more sources now for both fans uh, and, and others to get their sure. news about sports. Uh, Besides yourself, of course, uh, are there are there sources you would recommend that uh, people follow who uh, who are interested in in learning more about this intersection of sports and culture and politics and learning about sports, reading about sports more than a, than who won and lost? Well, it's so interesting. I'm actually I want to start with something you mentioned. Um, the other thing about the days of Muhammad Ali or Billie Jean King was that the sports uh, columnist had so much power in terms of shaping what you thought about a given athlete. Uh, when I was growing up, it was people like Dick Young in New York City. I mean, these were people to be feared. And that power of being a gatekeeper doesn't exist in the same way anymore uh, because there's so much access to sports writing. Um, there's a terrific website called uh, The Defector that I recommend for people that talks a lot about sports in a way that is well beyond wins and losses. Um, a lot of the people at the defector, they came from a website called Deadspin, uh, which still produces, I think, some very important work. Um, there's some books that I really recommend to folks, like a book called Redemption Song, Muhammad Ali and the Spirit of the 60s. Um, or, uh, or, and some of these um, athlete memoirs are absolute gold, like books like Ball Four by Jim Bouton or Second Wind by Bill Russell. Uh, and, and I think that's a great way to learn uh, how people talk. You can talk about sports in a way that's beyond just the wins and losses. And, um, and, and the good writing is out there. I mean, the main thing I would suggest is I'm, I'm so like when I want to learn about a subject, I'm sometimes more less likely to go to a website since there's so many of them and more likely to just go into my, uh, my, my Google search bar and typing in something like, you know, athletes, exploitation, NCAA, and just seeing what pops up and going down the rabbit hole that way. But I, I, I got to tell you, like when, when I started doing this work, and it's been about 15 years, um, when I started, uh, I was pretty lonely in terms of doing this kind of writing. And I'm lonely no longer. And I, I definitely appreciate how much great product is being put out there by people who are trying to look at this through a more political lens. Uh, looking at the uh, Black Lives Matter efforts, uh, you mentioned Colin Kaepernick's efforts to draw attention to racial injustice. Uh, and he was, of course, effectively blackballed from the NFL for his efforts. Uh, do you see that systemic racism within the sports world that led to his treatment is actually is, there, is, is it actually improving as a result of Black Lives Matter movement? Well, movements change things. 
Um, you know, that's institutions tend not to change through the actions of individuals, but only through much bigger social forces. I mean, that's the, the, the lesson of this country. And I think having the largest demonstrations in the history of the United States over this summer has definitely at least temporarily shifted the terrain in even conservative spaces like the National Football League. And I think that there, there are more openings now for players, not because the um, franchise owners have had some sort of come to, come to God moment about these issues, but more because the balance of power has changed pretty dramatically. And the players have shown the amount of power that they're able to flex in terms of shaping public opinion. And there's the fact that, you know, even the commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell, has said that he did not handle the Colin Kaepernick situation well and that he wished Colin Kaepernick could find a team. Now, the only reason why Roger Goodell said that was because, you know, he's dealing with a potential mutiny on his hands among players themselves who could go on strike and disrupt the entire economic flow of the system. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, radical rebellion at the base of sports right now that franchise owners and commissioners are, are hustling to catch up to. And as they hustle, uh, at least short term, it's going to mean a change in terms of how they interact uh, with players who choose to use their platform to speak about politics. What's the most, uh, what's the most effective thing that, that players can do? Um, is it, I mean, we talked about some of them, I and mean, part of it is, as you mentioned, they struck, they didn't play. Um, should they demand more money? Should they unionize? What really gets the attention of, of team owners and, and league officials? Um, I mean, it, it's disruption. I mean, it's, it's what, what I mentioned before about where the money is. I mean, some, I think we, we, sometimes we still act like sports. It's still 1955 and people are trying to get butts in the seats and sell lots of beers and things like that and programs. And that's just not where the money is. As fans, we're basically scenery at this point. You know, it doesn't look good if there aren't fans in the stands, but we're scenery. The actuality um, of sports economics is that the money comes through television deals, uh, particularly cable deals, uh, public funds for stadiums um, is a huge one, and, um, and like the top luxury box seatings. Uh, that's where the real money is. And uh, COVID makes the luxury box seating very rough, but they still have to pay off the, the public money that they get for the stadiums. And that means they need to broadcast these games to get the billions of dollars from the TV deals. So anything that players can do to disrupt that particular flow is where their power is. Now, how do they exercise that power and why should they exercise that power? I mean, how they do it is by thinking of themselves as labor in this situation and organizing themselves as such. Um, the, the, the why they should do it, it's like, no, I don't think, you know, they should do it for, for higher wages. I mean, that's of course their business, what they wanna organize for. But I think one of the things about the last year is that they realized that their horizons can be much higher than economistic demands, that they could actually be talking about shaping the world politically through their ability to play or not play. And that's an incredible step forward in terms of athletic consciousness from anything we've seen in the last 50 years. Do you, do you see uh, any professional athletes out there who may become candidates for office? Is that, is that out there anywhere? It's interesting, like, like the ones who are very influential, like LeBron, LeBron James, I wonder if that would be a demotion if they ran <laughs> for public office, given the influence that they're able to have as athletes, but I think it's something that we should um, expect going forward. I mean, it's interesting because the history of political athletes um, who actually go into politics, I mean, it tends to be um, on, on the conservative side of things. Um, you think of people like Steve Largent or JC Watts, uh, Lynn Swan, um, these Bonner, are, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike Ditka wanted to run for, uh, for Senator against a young unproven man named Barack Obama back uh, about 20, 25 years ago. So th th this is um, new terrain for a lot of these athletes. It'll be interesting to see how they choose to express and reflect their power going forward. A question from um, a member of the audience here who notes that um, uh, political action committee that is partly financed by athletes themselves uh, had some involvement in advocating for President Trump. 
Mm -hmm. the athletes disagree with these ads? Uh, can they shape the way in which their PACs advertising dollars are directed? Yes, they certainly can. And when that came out, it, it ruffled a lot of feathers among the players uh, themselves, um, especially because one of them, it was a union PAC too. So it wasn't just uh, one put forward by the franchise owners. So, but, but for oftentimes those packs have existed in the land of apathy relative to the players, like players just really haven't cared or noticed. And I think the, the break from that apathy with regards to politics is the greatest shift that we've seen uh, in, in this, in this period. Right. We've talked about, you know, what the what players have done, you know, how owners and leagues have responded. What about the fans? Um, some fans, you know, as we saw in this past election, well, I suppose it's still the current election right now. Uh, as we've seen in the election, this is still a pretty divided country. Yeah. Um, how we still have situations where many fans applauded Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee. Mm -hmm. Many fans were totally on board with that. Many were not. Mm -hmm. Um, how do athletes who are being activists win the hearts and minds of those fans who are um, who are offended by that, or do they? Well, I mean, you're, you're talking about my own family in this case. I mean, there are disagreements, my own family about, do we like this? Do we not like this? Don't we go to sports just to escape uh, these players through, in, through injecting politics into the game? They're actually preventing us from having this escape uh, this question has become much sharper since COVID as people are really looking for escape and to not be able to get that in the context of play, at least in the lead up to this election season, uh, has been really interesting. I mean, I think the best thing that players can do, and a lot of players have done this, is to be absolutely clear about why it is they're doing what they're doing. And that's how you really fight for the hearts and minds is you don't just let these things be symbolic and flow and flow out into the ether so people can assign any belief system they want to to what you do, but to really articulate what your demands are. And I, I think a lot of the players have shown and shocked people by their ability to uh, show that politics isn't just what happens in Washington, D.C., but, and that's the other, such an important uh, role modeling that they're doing, particularly for young people, but politics is how you choose to live your life, how you choose to stand up for what you believe in, that that's the kind of role modeling that athletes are doing now, which is such a break from role modeling, like you're successful if you have the biggest car or the biggest house or, you know, just abject materialism, but they're, they're, they're pushing a different kind of role modeling. And I think by doing that, uh, the hearts and minds are theirs to be won. Your latest book, um, which was co-written with Michael Bennett, former, mm -hmm. um, actually, I think he's still playing for Philadelphia. Oh, no, he just retired. Just retired. Anyway, we still think of him as a Seattle Seahawks defensive end out here. Who does he? Um, <laughs> and your, uh, uh, your book with Bennett uh, is Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. And in it, you and Bennett write about this myth that sports makes people more equal. Uh, is there anything sports can do uh, to promote that more equal society? Um, well, I'll tell you, if, if Michael Bennett was here, he would say, what's really the point if we're not trying to promote a more equal society? And we really need to use every tool in our toolbox to be able to try to promote um, a more egalitarian view of opportunity and education and food. I mean, this is, we, we go through all of this in the book. Um, it's like if people don't have an equal opportunity to even eat healthily or breathe healthy air, then what kind of society are we really trying to build in the first place if people are starting in such desperate straits? So that's where we are. Um, and I think that um, it also comes down to, this might not be what, what I, you, you thought I'd say here, but, but it also comes down, I think, to coaching and to youth sports. Because hmm. I think sports are really like fire and you could use fire to cook a meal or you could use fire to burn down your house. 
And so many of uh, youth coaches, they operate in a way where they use it, the fire to burn down your house. But if we use sports as a way to teach different kinds of lessons um, about teamwork, about community, about sticking up for people who can't stick up for themselves, then I can see sports being just an utterly powerful agent for social change. Yeah, I was going to ask you about youth sports and and just you know how well we're doing in this country on that. Um, uh, you know, you, you you see these stories about uh, you know little league moms and dads who are uh, uh, such you know fanatical fans uh, that it, it it really becomes less of a less of a sport uh, than a, this kind of grim combat. Um, what would be, you know, how can youth sports um, use fire to um, uh, to cook rather than to rather than to burn things down? I mean, I, I, it, it's got to be a community relationship, like like parents. I mean, there's a value system among parents in youth sports which can be really corrosive. Um, there's a value system among coaches, which can be really corrosive. I mean, but there needs to be, um, someone needs to be able to stand up for the healthy development, life and minds of the kids themselves. Like I was very lucky growing up to have coaches who really did care, um, about your community and about your teammates and about lifting each other up and about, as one coach said, you know, winning is just part of the process of doing things the right way. It's not the end goal. It's something that's along the journey. And I, now I coach youth sports and I try to do it the same way. Um, and I think that that's the way you have to do it. Sometimes I do have to quiet down some parents, quite honestly, to do it the right way and do it the way that I think it should be done. And, you know, we need more of that. I mean, so I would just advise you, you know, even if you don't know a lot about a sport, if you care about kids, get into this kind of work because that what the kids will remember is less the wins and losses than whether or not they actually had a good time right. and whether or not they were actually able to make friends and whether they were actually able to feel good about themselves when practice is over. And I, I think we need so much more of that. And, you know, perhaps that might be a way to combat this atomization that we see in, in American society and foster more community. Mm -hmm. Just stick with the stick with this book for a minute. Uh, the title, of course, is Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. Um, what are some of the things in the book that make white people uncomfortable? Well, this was uh, Michael Bennett's idea for a title. Um, you know, he wanted to call the book Things That Make White People Uncomfortable at Dinner. Um, and I said, well, let's get rid of the at dinner part. because It's a little long, but I mean, it's basically like Michael talking about, um, systemic issues in our society, because I think that there, there's a prevailing ethos, particularly among football fans who Michael is really addressing the book to, um, the prevailing ethos that says, you know, if you're, if you, you know, if you work hard enough, you can make it, you know, it's about your individual choice in terms of the efforts you put in. To, to your life. Um, and what Michael is putting out is like, well, wait a minute, there are these systemic barriers that I've experienced and that I've seen firsthand as a football player. And I'm going to give you my perspective about that. So Michael talks about, you know, the realities of, of what it's like to have to become an NFL player and the barriers that exist. But then he also talks about all the people who aren't good enough to play in the NFL and what does their education look like? What does their nutritional situation look like? What does their financial situation look like? What does their family situation look like? As a way to draw attention to the fact that a lot of folks have a very difficult time before they even get out of bed in the morning. And so I think what Michael was trying to say is that that very essential truth is something that makes us uncomfortable because it's so much easier just to say, well, if you just work hard enough, you can make it. And if you don't work hard enough, well, that's your fault. And I don't have to think about you because you've made the decision to fail. Mm -hmm. And Michael's saying that, that actually we, we have that entirely upside down. Um, just sticking with the book, uh, uh, this book uh, uh, has been quite popular. Yeah, it's uh, done well. A number of uh, uh, book clubs are reading it, including one that is attended by one of our members here. And uh, some questions came up about it. Uh, they love the book. Uh, and they want to know, you know, what was the process like working with Michael Bennett on this one? Uh, you know, how much of the writing did each of you contribute? Was it mainly interviews? And just how did that go? I mean, doing a book like that is a, is a real challenge. Um, 
because the number one this what, what's so um, difficult about it for, from my perspective is that you know I, I'm the one putting the book together and but if I mess it up everyone's going to say oh it's because Michael didn't have a story to tell so it's a lot of pressure so it's, it's like I know that if I screw up my end of things he's the one who's going to get the blame not me that's why it's so hard to do to, to do a book like this um, but the way we did it was first, you know, we sat down and I, I, I stayed with Michael and his family and just got to know him. And I tried really hard just to listen and learn the rhythm of how he speaks, because you want the book to be an expression of his voice. And then we did tons of interviews, like hours and hours and hours of interviewing. And then um, I did transcripts of what we did. And then I sat down with Michael and we looked at the transcripts you know, we had it organized already in terms of what we wanted to talk about in each chapter. And then we looked at the transcripts of what he had to say, and we turned that into writing together. And so, so that, that was the method, that was the process. Uh, it wasn't always easy, um, but it was very fun because he's a very fun guy to work with. So uh, it, it was a very rewarding experience all around. But I, you know, I have friends who are sports writers who are far, far, far more talented than I'll ever be. They'll never do a book like this. They don't write books with athletes because as soon as they feel like someone else's, uh, you know, someone else's spoon is in the stew, it's all going to get messed up. <laughs> but I actually, I mean, and, and I certainly am not rushing to do a book like that again, but having done one with Michael Bennett and having done one with John Carlos, uh, because our personalities got along well, it was, it was a lot of fun and we got through it. Right. Uh, just coming back to um, uh, the NFL for a minute, we, we've spoken about Colin Kaepernick and, and what happens there. Uh, but what's going to happen? You know, what should Colin Kaepernick do now? Does the NFL owe him an apology, uh, some sort of compensation for the damage done to his career? What what should what should Colin Kaepernick be looking for now? Oh, well, I mean, he still trains six times a week for the thought of getting that call to go back to the NFL. And I, I, the last time I saw him face to face, which was probably which was a little while ago, but he was in incredible physical shape. So he, it's clearly not just talk that he's training. Um, I, I mean, I, if he wants to play again, he should have the opportunity to play again. Um, but the, his world has also opened up dramatically. I mean, he's working on a television show with the director, Ava DuVernay, about his life growing up. Uh, he's working on a book. Uh, he does this charity uh, um, program called the Know Your Rights Campaign. So he's really trying to, to do it all and uh, while waiting for that phone call. So I, I, I have doubts whether that phone call is ever going to come because I think NFL franchise owners even though the commissioner has apologized to him and all this stuff, I think they see more value in Colin Kaepernick as a ghost story uh, mm -hmm. than they do as a living, breathing human being. And this idea that he can exist to haunt current NFL players uh, with this idea that if you dare step out of line, uh, you could find yourself out of work. And uh, I think for NFL franchise, an NFL franchise owner to bring him back would also be to admit terribly to a mistake. And these aren't people who like to admit mistakes by any stretch. Yeah. Let me ask you to make a, just a, a quick prediction here. Um, do you think the uh, Olympic games will happen next year? Should they happen next year? Will they or should they, of course, are two very different questions. Um, <laughs> I was out in Tokyo in 2019 uh, looking at the situation and, um, and, you know, they're doing some games in Fukushima where they had the, 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 both the, the weather and nuclear catastrophe out in Fukushima. And, you know, I, I went there with nuclear um, uh, scientists and observers and they, they were testing like the amount of, of uh, radioactive waste in the air. And it was still like very scary as of 2019. It wasn't nearly as cleaned up as they were trying to sell it as. So even apart from the pandemic, you know, I have got a lot of questions about Tokyo hosting the games and whether or not that's a healthy thing for athletes or spectators um, based on my own uh, research there. Um, 
Now, will they happen next year? So should they happen? Um, I would say no, not until we can be completely assured about Fukushima and certainly not until the pandemic is under control because the Olympics, because it's a global event, has, you know, has the potential to be the kind of global super spreader that could make uh, corralling this virus all the harder. Um, will they happen? Yeah, I think they will happen. And in a, in a Norwellian twist, they're going to be called the 2020 Olympics, even though they'll be played in 2021. Uh, so they'll be remembered for all time as the 2020 Olympics, but they'll figure out a way to make them happen. I mean, it's just, it's like with the NBA or the NFL, there's just way too much money riding on it for it not to happen. Let me just remind uh, members of the audience that if you, if you do have a question, we have uh, just a few more minutes to go. Uh, be sure to use the Q&A function and remember to hit uh, enter after you do your question. Um, so it sounds like, you know, from what you've said, the activism to get results really goes through television. Yeah. And that is the be all and end all of American sports. Mm -hmm. um, do the television networks have some responsibility here as well? Um, to, to, to promote um, a freer and fairer uh, type of sports that they're, that they're doing. Um, what, what, is, what is the responsibility of the television networks here? Well, it's interesting because I'd like to say that they should be more responsible. Um, and they certainly can be more responsible in terms of the journalists they hire and the perspectives they, they intend to promote. I think they can do a lot of work in that department. But structurally, they're really not built to be engines of social justice. I mean, they're, they're, these, are, these are, you know, it's almost like asking a, a dog to meow. Uh, they're, they're, they're a particular type of institution that I can't really see changing in the face of these protests other than providing space for a different kind of worker to be there at the station themselves who can deliver different kinds of perspectives. Uh, I think that would be a sign of great progress in the television sports industry. And one maybe we're just beginning to see. Does the, uh, does the incoming Biden administration uh, have a role in promoting, um, in promoting sports uh, as a way to build better communities in the United States? There, you know, there's so much. Yeah. have talked about this, but what about that? Oh, there's so much they could do. I mean, why don't, kids play baseball in the United States the way they used to. I mean, that's primarily a question of funding and access. Um, this is about community centers. This is about equipment. This is about coaches. This is about leagues. Uh, there's so much that could be done. I mean, far too often sports, particularly youth sports, has become the province for the few and not for the many. Yeah. I would love to see an Everybody Plays campaign because I hate the fact that young kids are sent a message very early on that there are those who play and those who watch. Right. And unless you have a certain kind of ability, you are, there to, you are there to watch and not to play. I think we could change that pretty dramatically and, and actually fight for trying to get everybody to play sports because sports are wonderful when done the right way. It's just too often they're done the wrong way, but that doesn't mean we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. There really is an opportunity for them to do something with sports that I'd love to see. Uh, whether or not they'll do it is an entirely other question. How the pandemic um, connects with that is an entirely other question. But I mean, if we get things under control and we're, we're I mean, think about, I think once this pandemic is under control, like people, there's going to be a thirst for people to go outside to interact and sports should be leading the way in that charge. Yeah. The, uh, during the world series, there, there were a number of ads that were, uh, I think promoted by major league baseball, um, on you know, raising money uh, to make it possible for kids to play little league. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, maybe you know, having a new administration that um, that actually believes in that uh, could could certainly have an impact. Uh, just quick, you know, speaking of fans again, you know, fans get really upset sometimes watching sports. Uh, you know, not just football and baseball, but soccer. I mean, they're, they're they're almost maniacal at times. Um, does this have any impact on violence in communities? I mean, is, is, is sports, can sport be responsible for, for promoting violence that way? 
I mean, you know, we, the, 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 the easy answer would be to say that violence predates sports. Therefore we can't <laughs> blame sports for violence, but I mean, but I think like how we, how we choose to consume sports, I mean, certainly plays a role um, in, in the um, emotional fervor of our given communities. Um, I mean, hopefully, you know, it's like sports is like anything else. It needs to be consumed responsibly. And uh, that's certainly not always the case by any stretch. I mean, I, I, I went through a period where I wasn't taking my son to games because, you know, there would be fights breaking out in the stands. Uh, but, but teams took steps to make it better, to change things, change when liquor was being sold, things like that. And that made a difference. So, I mean, the, the, these are problems with solutions. And I'd, I'd hate, to, I hate to lose one because of the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Um, we have just, uh, just a little bit more time here. Um, uh, let me just ask you one final question here and you can use this as a way to kind of, um, wrap up your, wrap up your thinking on where we are in, in sports and society right now. It's a big question, but you know, on balance, have sports in the United States done more good than harm? And can they do more good than harm? Well, when you ask that, I think of uh, what Dr. King said about Jackie Robinson. He called him a sit-inner before sit-ins and a freedom rider before freedom rides. And I think about the good that was done through Jackie Robinson's efforts to integrate Major League Baseball that you know, they would do barnstorming trips, the Brooklyn Dodgers throughout the South. And by doing so, they would be integrating communities just by the process of them traveling to these different towns, integrating, forcing the integration of stands and all the rest of it. Um, sports played this essential role. And then again, in the 50s and 60s, in the integration process throughout the Jim Crow South, usually through sporting events. Uh, was if you if you study these towns and say when was there first an integrated um, event here when was there first an integrated event here it starts you know with sports uh, similarly um, you know people think it's so interesting because you know people think it starts with lunch counters and Woolworth lunch counters and people sitting in at the lunch counters M far more than that it was sporting events and people protesting for the right to watch sporting events and barnstorming inter um, interracial teams. Uh, similarly with women in sports, I mean, sports has been a terrain where women have fought for, um, for equal rights throughout most of the century. And the fact that that terrain has even existed has been incredibly progressive. Um, I could say the same for LGBTQ people and the right to play sports openly as who you are and not have to live in any kind of a closet. I mean, what sports has done is it's provided a stage that has a universal language. So it's a stage for people to fight for inclusion in the context of a language that is sports that everybody feels like they can connect to. And so has sports done more harm than good? Absolutely, I think, and unequivocally, uh, precisely because it's given us the most uh, clear possible mirror for us to look at ourselves and to try to correct um, our flaws and deficiencies. I said that was the last question, but I have just one quick follow-up on that. We're, we're talking about the, the activism of, of especially black athletes. Uh, how united are black and white athletes in, um, in, 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 in being activists and advocates for, for, for justice and sports? Well, it's changed dramatically in the last year. Um, because in 2016, and I wrote about this a lot at the time, when Colin Kaepernick took his knee and other players started to speak out, you know, you could look far and wide for a white male athlete who would say something positive about them doing it. And you, they, you couldn't find it. Largely their response was, well, that's none of my business or that's their thing or whatever. But I think startlingly, startlingly in 2020, 
uh, you've seen a lot of white athletes step forward with a very different kind of perspective, saying instead, well, we're a team. And as a team, we see ourselves as a family. And if we are a family, that means I need to stand with my brother. That means I need to stand with my sister if they are upset about this particular issue. So that's a huge difference. Now, why did this happen? It only all it took were the biggest demonstrations in the history of the United States. That's all it took. But by doing that, I think it really did change people's ideas about how they relate to one another on, on a sports team. Right. All right. Well, thank you, Dave, so much for joining us today. Uh, this has been interesting, provocative, uh, I think everything we hoped it would be. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, this is our final program uh, for 2020 but we will be back in the new year with a new program in January. Uh, so be sure to watch the club's website uh, and your email for details about the subject and the date. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks again to our speaker. Um, be sure audience members, let us know what you thought of the program. You can send us an email at info at bellinghamcityclub.org. And again, we'll have a program in January uh, watch your watch your email. Watch the website for uh, details on subject and when it will be. So, with that, everyone have a great day. Stay safe and enjoy the holidays. Bye.